What's going on guys? So today let's go ahead and jump right into this topic. This is a topic actually supplied by one of our viewers, um, basically asking me questions or leaving comments and sometimes those comments become uh, topics for the following videos. So today we're going to be talking about personally collecting versus investing. There are many other parts to their initial comment, but I think I'm going to tackle those one video at a time um, because I think they're pretty broad subjects, but personally collecting versus investing. You know, we look at these things as if it's one or the other when it's not. You can have the best of both worlds. It is, it's difficult most of the time, but you can have the best of both worlds and there's so many ways that you can tackle uh, collecting Pokemon cards. So, <laughs> So first off, um, I don't know whether I'm going to use this in the thumbnail or not, but you've got cards that I consider uh, investment pieces, right? Um, and, and most of them are high-end, expensive cards, uh, mainly because it is a uh, good track of value. It's large pieces of equity. It's easier to um, to liquidate one card than to liquidate 30, 40, 50. Uh, so that's something that you have to keep in mind, but that shouldn't keep you from collecting the things that you love. It hasn't kept me from collecting the things that I love. I've just pulled back significantly because I realize if I am going to spend a lot of money in this hobby and not really budget, which is one thing that was also asked, and I'm going to talk about that in a separate video, but um, if I'm not going to be really strict on myself with how much I'm spending per month, I'm at least going to buy stuff that I think is going to hold up value and that just isn't a bunch of random stuff. Um, so you've got cards like my gold star Rayquaza that I look at and absolutely think that this card is a good long-term track of value. Um, this is about an $8,000 card, seven, $8,000 card. Um, so it's not something that you're going to see every day. Uh, but that's also why I think, you know, it's an investment piece. Now I also love Rayquaza. So for me, it's, it's still personally collecting, um, but there's cards like this Rayquaza, which is a PSA 8 Rayquaza, uh, the Emerald Rayquaza Hollow. This one actually has a really, really nasty swirl right here. Um, there's cards like this PSA 8 Rayquaza, which I find just as valuable and just as cool, uh, but this really wouldn't be about investing. Um, I picked this card up for 50 bucks. The cards like this to me, and this is a PSA 8, which I would say PSA... Anything really below PSA 9, I think most people would not um, really want for their personal collection. Um, I, I think that PSA 9 and PSA 10 are geared more towards investment pieces, and probably PSA 10 over PSA 9, uh, because the PSA 10, that's what everybody generally is going to want the most. But if this is for your personal collection, and <clears throat> the grade doesn't... like. You're not really nitpicking the grade based on like it has one speck of white or it's slightly off center. But the card is in like this one, really, really good condition. Let's just take a look at this PSA 8 real quick. This PSA 8 is in really, really good condition, right? I'm not even sure why it got a PSA 8, maybe because of, of, of centering and maybe some surface scratches that I just can't see. Um, but for the most part, there's some really, really nice PSA 8s, PSA 7s, PSA 6s, and you can get those cards for a fraction, like like nothing compared to what their PSA 9, PSA 10 counterparts might be. And so that's, that's one way that I've collected personally that I... I slightly regret because it's really hard to get value back out of it. But if you're just collecting and you're not thinking about when am I going to pull my money back out of this, uh, then absolutely go for it. But <clears throat> for stuff like investing, I know that people are looking for this specific card. Um, like many of the gold stars I have, guys, this is, this is a reason why I've been collecting crystals. Gold stars, I want to start collecting the Shining first editions, and I'm still working on my first edition base set. The reason that I'm collecting those sets is because they're, they're fun to collect. Um, they're relatively smaller collection goals, uh, which helps a lot. And they are more rare, more sought after kind of, uh, grail type cards, okay? 
not only are they kind of fun for me to personally collect, but there's still the investment aspect of them. But more so than anything, they're popular, and I know that they'll probably do well investment-wise. Am I the biggest fan of some of the crystals? No, absolutely not. Some of them I don't even like that much, uh, but I keep them in my collection because I do look at them as long-term investment pieces. If I were ever to sell my cards, I know that I would be selling a set that's pretty sought after. Um, and I'm also trying to complete it. I am a completionist, so I almost have the entire uh, crystal set complete, um, aside from Celebi, but like these cards, I mean, they're still sick, don't get me wrong, but they're not like, they're not like my top picks for Pokemon that I like, right? Like, I'm very basic in a sense that like, I like the legendaries, I like Charizard, um, I like Pikachu, the mascot of the hobby, you know, Rayquaza, Groudon, Kyogre, and those are also featured in the Gold Stars. A lot of the, some of the best Pokemon ever are featured in the Gold Stars and the Shinings, and we're going to go over all of that. The Crystals are kind of cool because they have Pokemon that you don't see getting a lot of spotlights, you know, like Kabutops and Golem and um, Kingdra, you know, you don't, you don't see these Pokemon getting a whole lot of spotlight. So I think it's really cool that they did get their time to shine as these crystal cards uh, from Sky Ridge. I'm trying to get this Kabutops to pop off a little bit. It's harder to get that hollow to show on camera. But, um, you know, I collect that stuff, one, because I see that it's what other higher-end collectors are going after. Um, and, and even they are going after, like, PSA 10s. I feel like more so than PSA 9, but usually... The crystals, gold stars, shinings, and first edition base set. Pretty much all those cards, and pretty much any any like chase card, any first edition chase card from any of the older sets. Um, they typically do really, really well. Like long term, like are good investment pieces. But it's also the the money going into it. If you don't want to put a lot of money into it then there's so many other options for amazing, cool cards that you could have. It just means that you might be collecting more personally than investing. Like, and, and you can do this with grading as well. You can pick up raw cards for cheap and get them graded. Um, here's a couple super cheap cards that some of these were gifted to me. I think one of them I paid for, uh, but the other two were gifted to me. And they're some of my favorite cards, but they're nothing special in terms of like investing wise. There's nothing special about these cards. So, you know, you've got Groudon and then you've got Kyogre and Groudon, which look very similar in their designs because they came out of the tins, I believe. Um, and then you've got this other Black Star Groudon over here that just looks absolutely stunning. I love this Groudon artwork so much. But this is an 8.5. It's a CGC 8.5. It's not really worth much. Uh, and then we've got over here, we've got a 6 and a 6.5. They're not really worth much. You know, there is a gnarly swirl on that Kyogre right there. Um, but they're just really, really cool cards. Um, I would, I would, I, I think that because I like Gen 3 a lot, cards like that, and then this Emerald Rayquaza, like cards like that just speak to me. I like them a lot more. Um, and they're some of the last cards that I've kept. I've sold a lot of my lower graded cards, uh, but they're some of the last cards that I kept. Um, and then of course there's grading. There's getting your cards graded. You can buy them raw, get them graded. That's a fantastic way to personally collect, but also be investing at the same time. Um, here's some cards over here. My friend helped me grade these. Um, so we've got the Sun and Moon Pikachu, and it's only in a, in a nine. I wouldn't call this an investment piece by any means, but it's just a really cool card. Um, Gengar Mimikyu, this was in a 9, and I, I bought this from a friend who got it graded, uh, just solely on the fact that I just really, really liked the card, and I knew that it wasn't going to cost me an arm and a leg. Here's Latios uh, and Latias. Uh, this was another card that I traded a bunch of lower graded cards at Collecticon for this card, and I'm happy with it being a 9. Um, I didn't want to trade too much going after the 10, and again, like there are some cards that you're just going to want. And it, it just doesn't make, it doesn't make rational financial sense to spend the kind of money it takes to buy these cards in PSA 10. If you get them graded and they hit a 10, fantastic. But a lot of cards in PSA 10 are just absolutely way overpriced and you should not be getting anywhere near them. Um, 
maybe not so much when it comes to modern, but when it comes to vintage, especially vintage grails, uh, that's stuff that you typically, like, I rarely ever buy 10s, okay? I have one 10 behind me, this, um, this crystal Charizard. That was one of the only 10s that I ever bought. Uh, and it was mainly because I couldn't find a nine that I really liked. So I just said, you know what, screw it. This is an auction, let's go for it. And it's one of my favorite cards to date now. I'm very happy to own that card. Uh, this, you know, I might as well show it. Definitely, this card is definitely, an, I would call, an investment piece and a personal collection piece. But, you know, one thing is you don't want your personal collection pieces getting in the way of being able to move your money around. And so when you put all this money into one card, you're locking up all of your funds where you're unable to put that into anything else. Uh, it is a beautiful card. I'm very, very happy and lucky to own this card. But when you buy a card like this, you're locking up all of your funds uh, and, and disabling yourself from making other moves. Um, in terms of... Uh, when you when we say investing, when we turn when we say personally collecting versus investing, I'm assuming that the investing is also entailing some sales in there, right? Uh, because eventually, if you're going to invest in these cards, you're going to have to sell them. You're going to have to have some sales experience. It's really important uh, to get some sales experience uh, before amassing a massive collection, uh, because at that point then it's just a chore trying to sell all that stuff and list cards one at a time. Whereas if you get into this hobby, you start collecting a couple things, you put a couple things up for sale, then you have a good balance of what you're buying and selling. Um, and so here's two copies of cards that I bought raw because they were modern, because they were modern, I was fairly confident that buying these raw, they would still be in really, really tip top shape, which made them easy to grade. Also to be fair, there's tens of thousands of these cards um, in grading in a PSA 10. So they're not really rare by any means, but they're both really, really beautiful cards to own. These are the cards that kind of defined uh, Sword and Shield. We've got the Rayquaza VMAX, which I think is my more favorite of the two. But of course, the Moon Rion, the card that everybody talks about, absolutely phenomenal. And if you're looking at those two cards, I would honestly try and find them raw. You can still probably find them raw and grade them in a 10. But even if I had to buy those cards in a nine, um, I don't think I would, I don't think I would be, I don't think I would mind buying those cards in a PSA nine. I mean, really like you're buying them for basically raw value, but they're slabbed and they're protected. People, that's a controversial opinion. I think a lot of people think that I'm stupid for saying that uh, like, you should buy a PSA 9. PSA 9s can be, you know, great collection and investment pieces uh, when typically it's like, no, you want PSA 10. If you're going for real value and appreciation, you're going to go for PSA 10. But at the end of the day, the PSA 9 price is just like getting the card raw, except you're getting it graded already. Somebody else's loss on the fact that they couldn't get it graded at 10 is your gain by getting your encapsulated, protected, raw pretty much mint, it's pretty much mint, it's just not PSA 10 mint, right? PSA 9 is still mint. Uh, if we look at, you know, it's it's gem mint versus mint, right? The jump is not that crazy. You've got mint over here, and you've got gem mint over here. Just the fact that it says mint, uh, that's, that's good enough for me, and it should be good enough for you too. Um, and here's uh, Crown Zenith Pikachu, which was my, my one of my favorite cards out of Crown Zenith. If not, my favorite card, the Secret Rare Pikachu. Um, and this card hit a 10, which really doesn't matter because it's not even worth that much. So like, whether you're gonna go grading or buying modern, you really wanna get it a modern, you like the artworks a lot more, I get that because this Pikachu artwork is absolutely insane. Unfortunately, um, a lot of these cards in modern just aren't worth very much and a lot of the alt arts um, trainer galleries, secret rares, what have you, a lot of them in modern just are not worth all that much because there are tons of them out there. That's not to say that they're not going to go up in value, but there's tons of them out there. So you have to keep that in mind. When I, when I like to really invest, when I like to personally collect and really invest, I'm going to stick with cards that are very few and far between, right? I'm going to go with cards that you don't see pop up on eBay every day. And the ones that you do see on eBay uh, or PWCC, um, they're really expensive. Uh, so let's look at some cards here that I personally collected with a little bit of, you know, investment mindset, but 
Um, I bought them pretty much on a budget and I didn't go crazy with buying these cards. So these are the only uh, Neo, Neo Destiny Shinings that I have. These are the only Neo Destiny Shinings that I have. Absolutely phenomenal. And I would say that that kind of, I would say that makes Neo Destiny probably uh, the best uh, Neo set. I would say, I would say that confidently that I think it makes it the best Neo set. The fact that it has all of these shinings in there, um, absolutely incredible. Um, but anyways, let's look again at these, um, even, even a PSA 8 means near mint to mint, so it's still a good grade. But as you can see, I want to go for these in first edition. These are all unlimited, so there's no first edition stamps on these, but they were only like two to three hundred a piece, right? At two to three hundred a piece, it's not that, it's not to say that that's not a lot of money, right? These four cards right here would be worth at least a thousand dollars, which is nothing to sneeze at. But just one of these and like a PSA, 10 or PSA 9 first edition would run close to or more than that amount, right? I think the PSA 9s, a lot of them you can find for probably under a thousand, but PSA 10s, most of them are over a thousand dollars for a PSA 10 first edition shining Pokemon. But I bought these because I thought, you know what? The only difference in first edition is the stamp. Um, why pay such a high premium for the same card when I could have it in PSA 9 or PSA 10 and be unlimited? So if you're trying to invest but not spend a huge chunk of change, you could look into all of the unlimited cards, you know, versus the first edition counterparts, right? When you're looking for the for most cards that you want to invest in, I, I would say across the board that first edition is the way to go. Now eventually first edition stamps get phased out and they're not in the hobby anymore, they're not on the cards anymore. So you really it's not something that you have to worry about, right? Um but with like at the end of Wizards of the Coast, you had uh, Expedition Aquapolis and Sky Ridge, which I constantly bring up on this channel. They're some of my favorite sets. They discontinue first edition on those sets. And then that continues with the e-reader series um, in 2003 onwards to 2007, I believe. Uh, and they don't have any first edition stamps from that point um, onward. Um, and I wonder if they'll ever bring something like that back. Probably not. Um, probably no reason to. But again, these cards still look absolutely incredible in my hands looking at them. Um, and like this Mewtwo is only a PSA 7. It's a PSA 7. It's not a high grade by any, by any means, but high grade or not, it's a really, really clean example of the card. It just looks really, really beautiful. And you get to enjoy the card um, and have it in hand with a fraction of the price of getting this card. Uh, PSA 10 first edition Shining Mewtwo, we're talking like $3,000 probably. We're talking like 3000 maybe even more than that. Um, but these cards get very pricey. This one was 300 So a tenth of the cost in a lower grade in Unlimited. Uh, and you can own these cards and have them and it's still a really, really nice piece of your collection without spending an arm and a leg. I think a lot of people consider like to invest, you have to spend an arm and a leg. No, there are investable cards that you can get in different variations. Um, I've been talking a lot about um, the first edition Charizard, how I really want to get my hands on a PSA 9 first edition Charizard. Recently, I got a first edition Venusaur and a first edition Blastoise, uh, and those are super iconic. Not only did I really want to personally collect those, but they're super iconic, and when you are investing, uh, you want cards, even if they're like, oh, those are so basic, like everybody knows about that, it's, it's, it's old news, but you also need that. You want cards that are popular. You want cards that are very popular, and that brings us kind of back to cards like uh, the Moonbrion. A lot of people hate on the Moonbrion because they're like, oh, there's 10,000 of them, they're not rare at all. Um, and my counter argument to that is, there's 10,000 of them, and there's also <laughs> way more than that. There's way more people than that that want this card, right? So when there's when it's really, really popular and there's a really high demand, the high supply is kind of irrelevant in that case. Um, I would say almost the same thing with the Latios Latias GX from Sun and Moon uh, team up. Um, but okay, going back to you know my my hunt and my need for a first edition Charizard. Um, 
You can always go with Shadowless. If I had a Shadowless still, I've since traded my Shadowless Charizard so that I could get this uh, Rayquaza, which is another thing. You can wait for conventions to trade. You know, you can build up a lot of semi high value, semi rare cards. And worst case scenario, if you if your tastes change and you realize, okay, I want to move on from like hundred dollar, two hundred dollar, three hundred dollar cards. I want to move into these these several thousand dollar cards. All right, I really want this one card, and I know it's a lot of money, but I would be willing to trade all of my lower value cards for a high value card. Uh, you can make trades privately. I wouldn't really recommend it um, unless you really trust the person and they have really good references. But there's also the idea of going to Collecticon, going to just a trade night, a convention of some kind, and having the chance to trade with some of the vendors. Uh, Pete at Grogu Loves Cards traded me for this Rayquaza. I traded my... It was a pretty beat up PSA 5 first edition Charizard. I had two at the time, but it was, it was my really beat up copy. Um, so I was kind of happy to let that one go. Um, and that was that was my first high end card, right? It was only a PSA five, but it was several thousand dollars. I traded that, um, my two Shadowless Charizards, which were each worth a couple hundred dollars, um, a base set two Charizard that was a PSA eight, um, which still really it was still really really nice. I love the base set two cards with the Cosmo Hollow. They just look phenomenal. Um, and uh, some cash on top, I think, for that Rayquaza. Would I have gone into Collecticon with $8,000 and bought this Rayquaza? Absolutely not. I would not have done that. That's just It's just not something that I would have done or been able to do. So even if you're collecting lower end cards, there's a good chance that they're popular cards enough, which people dogged on me for collecting Charizards. Like, I, I, I remember I would get comments like, oh man, like, just the Charizard, bro. Like, oh man, it, it's just like Charizard is so overrated. But at the end of the day, Charizard is what the mass majority of people like and want. Charizard, Mewtwo, Pikachu, those are the big top names that people really want. Gengar, I would throw Gengar up there. Um, Gengar is also one of my favorites, super popular. Really want to get my hands on a Sky Ridge Gengar. Um, but, uh, you can go into these events and then trade up all of your cards for even higher end cards. So there's there's no real, I feel like there's no real rhyme or reason to personally collecting and investing. You know, if you're just in it for the money, scratch everything I just said and go for high end grail cards, okay? Because those are the cards that are gonna be tough to get, that you're gonna have an easier time finding someone who's really been looking for that card and can't, has no other options, right? When you're talking about really high end grail cards, you're talking about cards that there are no real great examples of out there on the market, right? You're, you're stuck with only a couple of options and it makes it much easier to sell those cards. And that's a big reason why I've been trying to sell cards like that um, and move away from selling a bunch of cheaper cards, uh, which is what I'm still doing on eBay, uh, because uh, at the end of the day, I think that that's going to be a better investment and a better, um, a better profit. Uh, recently, I sold my first edition, one of my other first edition Charizards. I sold it on eBay. I picked that card up for about 4200 That was the second one that I picked up, so it was a little more expensive. And I just sold it for 5250 Now, granted, I picked that card up like two years plus ago, so it's not like I picked that card up and flipped it immediately. That was not the case. Um, it did take some time, but... Eventually, I ended up selling it and I got a thousand dollars of a profit on that card, right? That's, that's really hard to do selling, like to get a thousand dollars profit, you would have to sell a ton of these smaller slabs and gosh, you, I mean, you, you might have to sell a hundred or two hundred of them to make that kind of profit on a card like that. Now, if you're buying big collections, you're grading all the cards and then you're selling the slabs, sure. But I bought most of these cards slabbed or I, I didn't get a gr great grade on them, so they're really not worth that much more, which means I would have to sell a ton of them to make that kind of money, uh, which, which is why I think you know buying the um, higher end, more expensive cards can yield a better return overall. Um, but then you have cards like this. You know, I talk about my first edition Charizard, how that's a card that I would really want. 
Um, but I bought this base set unlimited Charizard raw. I bought a lot of them raw and a lot of them came back with so, so grades, which was a little bit disappointing. Um, but it just goes to show that I am not the kind of person that should be grading their cards because I clearly don't understand well enough how the grading scale works and what to expect on, you know, getting a return. You know, I look at some cards and I see a PSA 10, but they get a PSA 9 and it just is what it is. Uh, but <clears throat> here's a, here was the best grade that I got back on a base set unlimited Charizard, uh, which is why I've decided to keep this one, especially if I don't end up pulling it from one of these base set heavy packs when we hit 5,000 subscribers. Uh, <clears throat> but here is mine. They got these nice, these are the old school eBay stands. I don't know if y'all remember these, but that was back when they just started the authenticity guarantee. And they came with these dope stands, which I have about five or six of. These stands are so cool. Um, but here's my base set unlimited Charizard and only a PSA 7. Um, but the thing is, the card still looks absolutely amazing to me, all grades aside. Uh, but a PSA 7 is only worth like 300 bucks. If this was a PSA 10, it would be worth 10,000. So the condition rarity is a really big deal. Uh, if you are you know, buying to solely invest, I would go for cards with the highest condition rarity, you know, PSA 10 uh, more than anything. Um, but, or you know, with CGC, uh, you could go for the pristine labels or with BGS, with Beckett, you could go for the black labels, even though those are really, really, really hard to get. Um, so condition rarity is a really, really big deal. Uh, but there are times where just this $300 base set unlimited Charizard, it's just, it's beautiful. I, I, this card will never get old to me. Um, and there's ways of collecting where this card is still semi an investment, right? It's not shadowless. It's not first edition. It's unlimited, but this is a super popular Pokemon card. So everybody knows about base set unlimited Charizard. So it's a really easy card to unload if you need to unload this card. Um, and then here's another one we got back recently. This, I paid 50, I think I paid about 120 for that PSA 7, which ended up is now worth 300 being a PSA 7. Um, and then I paid $50. I've done well, I, I, would, I think I've done well on, on the Charizards. E, e, all value aside, um, overall, uh, even the ones that didn't get great grades, I paid it usually a hundred dollars per card. There was only one that I paid over 200 and it didn't, it didn't do that well. And I already sold it. Um, but other than that, most of them I paid around a hundred bucks for it. And I'm pretty happy about that. But, um, here we have a power keepers Charizard, uh, that I picked up for $50. Uh, it was pretty cool checking back on my eBay history. And now it's a PSA eight, which is worth more around 200. Uh, or at least maybe 170 to 200. But here's my Power Keepers Charizard. It's an absolute beauty. It's a really, really nice card. Really nice Cosmo Hollow on there. I like that it's got the dark background, kind of like the Team Rocket Charizard, but it's got that moon in the background. This is a really, really sick card. Not a crazy expensive card. I wouldn't consider it an investment piece, but by buying them raw and having them graded, uh, it did kind of somewhat plus uh, the addition of time going by, right? I bought these about a year ago, two years ago. So time has passed by and the market has moved a little bit. So you can definitely invest on lower end cards, right? There's, there's, you can make so many plays on cheaper cards. This isn't like a, this isn't like an elitist thing where it's like you have to buy high end cards to make money, but there's no doubt about it that when you buy a super high end PSA 10 vintage grail card, there's going to be a collector out there that's willing to pay that premium to get that card. I've seen this uh, several times now in selling high-end cards. Um, I remember when I sold my, I had a PSA 8 Crystal Charizard before I had that 10. And I remember uh, I traded about three grand worth for that card, maybe $4,000 worth for that card. Um, and then it ended up selling for, I think, 4800 I believe. And after fees, which I really should have sent that card to the vault. So I ended up selling it off eBay without sending it to the vault and I paid fees on it, which we, I need to do a separate video talking about vault. I know I've, I've been meaning to do that for a while, but, um, you know, I made a couple hundred bucks off that card and I've never experienced making money that easily off of any card. So it's, it's, um, it's really these, you know, several thousand dollar cards that tend to have a larger profit margin. They are a lot more expensive. So it would make sense that the, 
the um, the percentage of profit on those cards would would yield a, a larger return than cheaper cards. Um, but there are also you know there are weird random plays like error cards and miscut cards and. You know, there's all kinds of weird plays out there, including getting raw cards graded and then you get a really good grade back. There are ways to make 100% returns and have great flips. I'm not the best at giving advice on how to make those plays, but there was a, there was an error card that I had that I picked up for free basically, and I ended up selling it for 250. And then the next one I sold for 300. So there are definitely, or I think I sold the first one for 200 and the next one for 250. I'm not sure. Either way, those cards cost me next to nothing and I sold them for a couple hundred each. So there are definitely plays out there that don't require you to have a lot of capital, that don't require you to spend a lot of money. You just have to have a really good eye. Um, and I think buying collections is one of the best ways that you can personally collect and have fun with it. And it's kind of all a mystery and ad adventure and a story that goes along with it and memories. I think buying collections is one of the best ways you can collect and invest at the same time. Um, but there's definitely a middle ground of collecting and investing. Um, I bought someone's collection, uh, again, like two years ago, I bought someone's collection for like 270 bucks. I sold pretty much all the other cards. Um, and when I was done with it, I was about 60 bucks or 70 bucks in on this Blaine's Charizard, which is now worth around 150. It's only a PSA six. Nothing crazy. It does have a six swirl. We may or may not be able to get that swirl to show. You guys might see it right here. Um, it's got a pretty, pretty gnarly swirl. Um, but yeah, I picked this guy up for basically 60 bucks. A friend graded it for me and uh, it came back as a six, but I'm not upset about it. It's still an absolutely beautiful card. Um, and Blaine's Charizard, 60 bucks in on that card. Blaine's Charizard, I mean, grading Grading is really probably one of the best ways, if you can get a cheap enough cost basis on cards, grading is one of the best ways you can make money, invest, and personally collect. I, again, I don't grade cards a whole lot, I wish I would more, but I also need the experience and need the interaction of buying a collection, a big diverse collection for a good price to actually grade cards uh, really easily. We don't have a lot of shops around here that source really high condition um, ungraded cards. That is something that I think I'm gonna get back into because it seems like you guys liked that content when I would go to my local shops, buy a bunch of raw cards, and then show you guys my hauls. So I might start doing content like that again, uh, but in most cases, uh, it was cards um, that really did, didn't do that well graded. So I, I kind of stopped doing that and started to refocus on buying the high-end cards that I've wanted for a long time. Uh, and, and I'm pretty happy with that. I've spent an arm and a leg on building up my kind of grail collection, but I would say when I look for value in my collection, the easiest place to find it is in my higher value cards, right? I can look at my higher value cards and I can see like a year's worth of salary when I look at those cards. It's harder to see that by compound, by compiling everything else in my collection and being like, what's all of this worth? It's really, really hard to put a price on everything that I have and I've collected over the years. Uh, whereas when I look at my briefcase with my most valuable cards, it's like instantly it's, I can add up all those cards and see where the market value is and see that, oh, okay, I have this much put into these cards. Um, and that's pretty incredible. Um, but uh, yeah, there was uh, my, my Gold Star Alkazam is another great example of getting cards graded. Uh, let's see, here he is. I picked this guy up along with other cards that I sold, which probably offset the cost even more uh, with the cards that I sold probably made this card really more like 30 or 40 bucks. But for 60 bucks, I bought a disheveled shoe box of Pokemon cards. And inside of that shoe box had this um, Gold Star Alakazam, which at the time I didn't even realize was super valuable. Uh, but upon grading this card, it came back with a seven. It's worth about $500. Uh, this, this card would be a huge win if I sold it. But because this card is a part of a bigger story, I have not sold it. And honestly, the Alakazam Gold Star is super underrated. Such a beautiful card. Uh, but yeah, that was another one of those rare events, occurrences, where I did really, really well buying a raw card and just getting it graded. Um, I will say, 
if you want to get PSA 9s, PSA 10s, that's going to be really, really tough to do by buying them raw and getting them graded. As far as these kind of vintage grail cards that are really tough to find, the, a, a lot of that reason is because people were, were handling these cards as kids. Uh, when we were younger, like some of the most popular cards were the ones that we were handling the most and showing our friends. So those cards got the most of the beatdown, which makes them really, really hard to find today. A lot of the best examples have already been graded and are out there. Uh, take, for example, um, this Gold Star Gyarados. This Gold Star Gyarados is extremely rare, um, and even in a PSA 9, which mine's a PSA 9. PSA 9 is worth around $3,000 in, in today's market. Um, and I have mine set on eBay for a lot more just because I don't really want to get rid of it. But uh, there's a to get a PSA 10 copy of this card, it jumps significantly up to $12,000 pretty much. Maybe you could probably get it for 10 or 11. Um, but that's the cheapest listing on eBay is a $12,000 one by Black Label Blaster, which Black Label Blaster, if you haven't seen his listings, um, that dude is like one of the kings of like high end grail uh, gold stars up for, for listings. Like he has, I think the most PSA 10 gold stars up for listing than anybody else. And it's worked for him. It's, it's allowed him to make very large returns on these cards that he's put a lot of money into. So you've also got to risk it to get the biscuit. But uh, in PSA 10, there's only 34 of these cards in existence in PSA 10 for the Gold Star Gyarados. Um, 34 in the world, maybe 35 now. But guys, that makes this card extremely valuable. And it also goes to show that most of these cards most of the Gold Star Gyaradoses that could even get a 10 have already been graded. Um, we have not seen an increase in a lot of these pop numbers go up for these Gold Stars, which is why I like Gold Stars so much. But it has to be your thing, right? Um, and when, I have to admit, it has to be your thing because when I first got into collecting Gold Stars, I, I didn't really... I didn't really appreciate them that much. I think I appreciate them a lot more now knowing their rarity, but that's something that I think like you, as a collector, you evolve over time, and that's just something that you're gonna have to experience for yourself. Um, I will say, when I first got into collecting, I was buying a lot of theme decks, and you know I've talked about this a bajillion times on here, but I was buying theme decks because I loved them. I was personally collecting at first. I was not investing at all when I was buying into Pokemon. Initially, I wasn't even thinking about investing. I mean, I knew that stuff could go up and I was excited about that, but I wasn't buying Pokemon theme decks saying that like, this is gonna be my retirement right here. I was buying them because I liked them. And then I had so many that I was buying because I liked them that I ended up starting to sell them. And so I, I did really, really well selling theme decks on Mercari um, and still have done well at least I sell like one a week now which is fine for me I'm down to like my last six or seven theme decks um, but there used to be like 50 60 theme decks that I had posted on Mercari and I've sold most all of them I'm just I'm focusing on so many other things that I've stopped buying and selling theme decks but that was one thing that gave me really good balance when I started collecting was I was always trying to sell stuff and buy stuff. And I think you have to have a balance there. If you're just collecting stuff personally and you're not thinking about the investment or the selling side of it, then eventually it's going to catch up to you and you're going to realize that you're hoarding more than anything. You've got way too much stuff. Uh, this was a, I've had this conversation with a couple of my friends and I think all of us have been hoarders at some point, and then eventually you trim down your collection. Anyways, um, I'm glad I, I did this video earlier in the day. I did this video in the morning. We are on. We are. We are racing against the clock here to get 5,000 subscribers by Wednesday. I don't know if it's going to happen now because Wednesday I was hoping that we would do the uh, we would do the live stream that we always do, except it would be special. We'd open a base set heavy pack because we hit 5,000 subs. Guys, if we don't hit 5,000 subs, I am not opening that base set heavy pack. And that's not to troll anybody, right? If we have to do the opening a couple days later, that's fine. But I want to see 5,000 subs on my channel before I open that pack because that's what we said we were going to do. That's how we're going to do it. Um, I should have my Pokemon 151 in by tomorrow. So we should be able to open some 151 uh, tomorrow for the live stream. We'll have a discussion. We'll open some 151. It'll be a lot of fun. Anyway. Anyways, 
hopefully this video helps get some more subs. Um, you know, people have been asking me, why don't you ask for likes and ask for subs? That's not something I do a lot. Okay, I am never going to be like, make sure to hit that like button, make sure to hit that subscribe button. That's just not what I'm going to do. What I will tell you is that we are going to open a base set heavy pack of 5,000 subs. If you want to sub, even to unsub in the future, whatever. That's your prerogative. I don't care. As long as we hit 5,000 subscribers, then I can say, hey, we're at 5,000 subs. Let's open this base set heavy pack. Let's go for it. So that'll be a lot of fun. Anyways, this video went way longer than I had intended, but I think it's a really broad topic talking about personally collecting and investing. And I'm sure that I missed a bunch of points that I could have added to this. So like always guys, uh, the comments are always a great place for people to go when they are watching my stuff and watching my videos, seeing what everybody else thinks. Feel free to leave a comment. Let us know what you think. Uh, maybe give some advice to people that are coming into the hobby, that are newer collectors. As we grow this hobby and grow our community, which we want to do, the you, we really want to see this hobby grow. Otherwise, it's just you know it's kind of going to fizzle out. And it hasn't been helpful that Scarlet Violet has been such a bad era, in my opinion. Um, but we want to grow this hobby. So if you have helpful commentary or advice, leave it in the comments. Leave some advice that's helped you collect, budget, um, sell, invest, whatever have you. Leave advice. Leave a strategy that's worked for you in the comments below. Anyways, peace out, guys. Have a fantastic day. I hope I did as good of a job as I could have at, on talking about um, collecting personally versus investing. Uh, this was just a question kind of phrased to me in the comments and tried to answer it in the best way I could. Anyways, peace out guys. Remember you can collect stuff that doesn't have to be super high value stuff. I love my cards that are lower graded cards. I have no issue with buying lower graded cards. And I assume that one day when I collect my personal collection goals, I will probably start buying and selling lower graded raw cards because that's just, that's just fun to me. It's fun having stacks of cards or buying a binder or someone's collection. It's so much fun. It, it, it beats buying one grail card any day of the week. And I will always stand by that. But still... If you want to buy the high-end grail cards for your personal collection, you're going to have to set aside all of your other collection goals and you're going to have to go over those those number one priorities for your collection goals. And that's what I'm trying to do right now. That's why I'm not buying a lot of fun stuff. That's why we're not doing a lot of openings. That's why I'm not going to the store and buying a big Pokemon card haul. Um, I'm really saving all of my money to buy specific cards so that I can cross off my number one collection goals. And then we can really spice things up and start doing more fun stuff on the channel. Anyways, peace out guys, for real. I'm going this time.